Support for Ben Franklin's World comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. And this episode is brought to you by the Doing History, How Historians Work series. The Doing History series here on Ben Franklin's World started because you asked me questions about how historians work, and I asked the Omohundro Institute for help. I approached the OI because they know how historians work. They've been supporting and promoting the work of scholars who study the history of early America for over 74 years. So it was natural that we should partner and produce the Doing History series, 14 episodes that take you behind the scenes of how historians have come to know what they know about the past. Each episode features a scholar of early America who tells you about their particular research and then takes you behind the scenes of a particular aspect of their work. So we answer your questions of how historians come up with their research topics, how they research those topics, and how they turn their research into the books, articles, and exhibits we all love to read and visit. For more information about the series and for a complete episode list, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash doing history. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 129 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each year, the states of Maine, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin celebrate Patriots Day, a state holiday that commemorates the anniversary of the Battles of Lexington and Concord, which took place on April 19, 1775. Now, Patriots Day is observed on the third Monday of April, and in Massachusetts, we observe this day by reenacting Paul Revere's ride in the battles, running the Boston Marathon, and watching the Red Sox play in Fenway Park at 11 o'clock in the morning. The battles of Lexington and Concord are a big deal in Massachusetts, and they're also a big deal in terms of the history of what would become the War for Independence. Because the battles of Lexington and Concord mark the first military engagements between rebel colonists and regular British soldiers. How did the colonists and regular soldiers get to the point of war? What happened that protests turned from public affairs meant to shame government officials and destroy offending property like tea into armed conflict? John Bell, the prolific blogger behind Boston1775.net and the author of The Road to Concord, How Four Stolen Cannon Ignited the Revolutionary War, joins us to investigate these very questions. During our investigation, John reveals... Details about the aftermath of the Boston Tea Party of 1773, what the Massachusetts Government Act was and how the people of Massachusetts responded to this punitive measure, and information and clues about the Boston Artillery Company's four missing cannon and how they may have been stolen. But first, do you live in upstate New York or have a desire to visit the Mohawk Valley? On Saturday, April 29, 2017 at 1 p.m., I'll be at the Oneida County Historical Society in Utica, New York, speaking about my research on the post-revolution New England migration into New York. I love this topic, and I think it'll be a really fun talk. And if you're in town, I'd love to meet you. Look for a link to the Oneida County Historical Society and their calendar of events in the show notes and in your Ben Franklin's World app for more information. Okay, are you ready to travel down the road to Concord? Let's go meet our knowledgeable guide. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a Massachusetts-based writer who specializes in the history of Massachusetts and Boston during the period of the American Revolution. He's the proprietor and blogger of Boston1775.net and a regular contributor to a second blog, The Journal of the American Revolution. Today, he joins us to discuss Boston, Massachusetts and the American Revolution with details from his book, The Road to Concord, How Four Stolen Cannon Ignited the Revolutionary War. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, John Bell. Thanks a lot, Liz. Great to be here. And we're delighted you've come back, John, because we're going to have a different, albeit related, conversation to our earlier one about the Stamp Act riots of 1765. Yes, we're going to move ahead nine, ten years. That's right. But before we launch fully into the years of 1774 and 1775, I think we should take a step back to 1773. Now, the road to Concord traces how both the Patriots and the British Army under General Thomas Gage sought to seize cannon and other armaments 
in preparation for wars starting in September 1774. John, let's start near the beginning of the road to Concord. Would you tell us about the Boston Tea Party in December 1773 and about Parliament's response to it? Sure. Now, I know you've already done a very fine interview on what led up to the Tea Party, so I won't go into that again, but the end of that confrontation over this new tax was that a large group of Bostonians destroyed a very large amount of property belonging to a very well-connected British company. And this was at the end of a long train of difficulties, confrontations, and violence that Bostonians had carried out against the British Customs Department, other royal officials, and merchants who were friendly with the royal government. So the Parliament in London decided that this simply could not stand. They had to take a very strong stand against what Boston had done and punish the town. And as a result, they put together a series of laws that have become known as the Coercive Acts. One of the first was called the Boston Port Bill, which it is said closed the port of Boston to trade from outside the colony of Massachusetts. No ship was legally allowed to bring in goods, and the Customs Department moved out of Salo. The Royal Navy started to patrol the harbor, and that was supposed to be a temporary measure until Bostonians repaid the cost of the tea. That was the first of the coercive acts. The second, and I think the most important in terms of what it prompted in the colony of Massachusetts, was called the Massachusetts Government Act. And that fundamentally changed the constitution of the colony and provoked an almost immediate response. Yeah. Would you tell us more about the Massachusetts Government Act and the response it provoked? Well, under the Massachusetts Colony's Charter of 1692, the province was governed with a combination of top down and bottom up authority. Top down from London, the parliament, working in the name of the king, appointed the governor. It appointed the lieutenant governor. It appointed the judges and the sheriffs. And through the governor, it appointed the justices of the peace and many other offices. But there was also a bottom-up source of authority coming from the people, or really the white men of property, where in town meetings, they would elect their local officials, their selectmen, their hog reeves, their surveyors of fences, the people who handled the tasks of local government. They would also elect representatives to the general court, which was the lower house of the legislature. And that group of gentlemen would elect an even further selected group who would serve as the governor's council. So the council ultimately derived its authority from the bottom, from being elected in these two or three levels. The governor could negative or veto a particular councillor, but once the councillor was seated, the governor was stuck with him. And furthermore, the council's approval was needed for certain important actions by the governor, such as allowing troops to be in the province or approving judges and such things. So it was not democratic by any means, but it was, as I say, a combination of top-down and bottom-up authority that went a little farther than most of the other British colonies. In most British colonies in North America, that council that advised the governor was all appointed by London. And one of the things that the Massachusetts Government Act did was it changed the Massachusetts Council so that it was also appointed by London. The new councillors were appointed by what was called a writ of mandamus. So they were referred to in the political arguments of the day as the mandamus councillors or the newfangled councillors. The Massachusetts Government Act did some other things which cut down on the possibility of bottom-up government and authority. Most notably, those town meetings, they could no longer be held except once a year without the express advance approval of the governor so that people who were used to, whenever they had a problem, simply going to their neighbors and saying, let's meet and discuss this and come up with a new law or appoint somebody new, they were theoretically barred from doing that under the Massachusetts Government Act. So there were other provisions as well, but those two were the big ones that made people in Massachusetts very upset as soon as news of the law arrived in the late summer of 1774. I can see why the people of Massachusetts were so upset over the Massachusetts Government Act. And I wonder, did the people living outside of Boston blame Boston and its citizens for the act because it ultimately came about because they had destroyed the tea in protest? 
Well, that was what the royal government probably wanted to happen, that the rural people of Massachusetts would see Boston as troublemakers, would see the small faction of Whig politicians as the worst troublemakers, and they would repudiate all this trouble that that small faction had been creating. That was always how loyalist officials, both in America and in Britain, saw the problems, that if they could only get the bulk of the fine British colonists away from the influence of these few troublemakers, then everything would be calm again. In fact, what happened with the Massachusetts Government Act is it did exactly the opposite, that suddenly small towns, rural towns that really had not had a dog in the fight with the crown before. They had many times supported the resistance to the new taxes, but they weren't the people going out and trading. They didn't have sugar refineries, things like that. But with the Massachusetts Government Act, it became clear that this was their fight too. And furthermore, because that law was promising permanent changes rather than being conditional, like the Boston Port Bill, it seemed to confirm what those troublemakers in Boston had been saying for many years, that the Crown wanted to abridge the rights and privileges of the whole colony, not just the people in Boston. So the act kind of backfired on Parliament. I mean, they tried to rein in Boston by passing the Massachusetts Government Act, which they likely hoped would turn the people of rural Massachusetts against Boston. But instead, the act actually caused the people of rural Massachusetts to ally with Boston. Yes, and not just allying, but it became quite clear in August and September 1774 that the people out in the rural parts of Massachusetts were even more militant at this point than the people in Boston. The trouble started in mid-August as the farmers in the most western part of the province and forced the local courts not to hold sessions, forced the magistrates to promise that they would not open the courts, they would not have any rulings, they would not fine anybody, they would not make any decisions under the new Massachusetts Government Act. That's not as well documented because it was out in the rural areas where there was no newspapers, but that became an inspiration for the next county to the east to do the same thing. And then it just rolled across the province with these crowds turning out to close the courts, as it was called. Now, We know the Bostonians were famous for protesting all sorts of acts that the British government tried to implement and force upon them. Did the people of Massachusetts, and I'm talking about all those inside and outside of Boston, find a way to protest the Massachusetts Government Act in ways other than closing the courts? The first thing they did was to close the courts in order to prevent any meeting under the Massachusetts Government Act. There were people who were refusing to serve on juries for the same reason or even earlier because the royal judges were taking salaries from the government in London. They also, as the men who had been appointed to be mandamus counselors in August and September 1774, some of them were intimidated, some by violence, from taking the oath and agreeing to that, so that when, by the end of the summer, the new governor, General Thomas Gage, had only a partial council and a lot of people saying that they would rather not be involved at all. So there were lots of ways of protesting. Boston had prepared many of the rural towns for this by forming a permanent committee of correspondence a few years before. It was an idea of Samuel Adams to continually keep up communication with like-minded political leaders in other towns and other provinces. And that provided a vocabulary, a sense of shared ideas, a communications network that really kicked into gear in 1774 as the new laws from Parliament seemed to require a bigger and bigger and more unified response. It seems like unrest in Massachusetts really picked up in 1774. And in your book, The Road to Concord, you describe something called the Powder Raid, which actually kicked up the unrest even more. So would you tell us about the Powder Raid of 1774? Sure. That was on September 1st, and General Gage had been alerted by a militia general that most of the gunpowder from a certain gunpowder storage tower in what is now Somerville, it's still there up on a hill, it's a stone tower, most of the gunpowder had been taken away by the people or the militia units that owned it. And the only powder left in the tower was what was assigned to the province itself. 
he had the authority as royal governor to do whatever he wished to with militia resources like the rest of the gunpowder that was stored there. And as a matter of safety and security, he decided that he needed to take control of that, not leave it out in the countryside. So early on September 1st, 1774, he had a squadron of regular army soldiers row up the Mystic River, march across land to this house and take away all the powder that was sitting there. He also had them confiscate two cannon that were in use by the Middlesex County Militia nearby in Cambridge. He took all that military material and brought it to the fort in Boston Harbor called Castle Island, where it was completely safe from anybody out in the countryside and the radical activists who might try to steal it. And General Gates thought this was a smart move. He was so pleased that he actually, at the end of that day, September 1st, issued a call for a new Massachusetts legislature for new elections. So he was feeling confident that he was putting the province back onto a steady, secure footing where he could continue to exercise authority. That wasn't what happened. Instead, the next day, thousands of men marched into Cambridge. They had been brought by exaggerated rumors of damage that had happened on this raid. They had heard that people had been killed. They were hearing that Boston was in flames. None of that was true, but just like the men in the western part of the colony had risen up to close the courts, the men in the central and eastern parts of the colony were rising up to resist the removal of their militia weaponry and to demonstrate their disapproval. They forced all the royal appointees in Cambridge, two members of the Mandamus Council, the sheriff, the court clerks, all of them had to either resign or apologize. And then at the end of the day, they went out to the mansion of the lieutenant governor, 4,000 men surrounding his house, and forced him to resign, or at least sign a resignation. It was, of course, never accepted. So this was the people outside of Boston being even more militant than the people inside Boston. By the end of that second day, September 2nd, 1774, it became clear that General Gage no longer had any authority outside of Boston, outside of places where he had troops, that he could not simply say, I am the royal governor, I am the representative of the king and parliament, and therefore this is what you should do. People were simply rejecting that outside of Boston. John. It really seems like events were spiraling out of control by September 1774. I mean, I know we get to look at history with clear hindsight because these events have already happened, but it really does seem to us like the situation was deteriorating. So we're left to wonder, how did the colonists of Massachusetts go from closing the courts in protest against the coercive acts to actually removing and hiding gunpowder and starting to arm for war? Well, in many ways, it was out of control because there was no real organized authority for the protesters at this point. And you can see the Boston organizers actually quite worried about the level of protests. During the powder alarm, a group of some of the leading Boston organizers gathered by Dr. Joseph Warren went rushing out to Cambridge to try to calm down the crowd. Later in the month, when there were protests within Boston over artillery, which we'll get to, again, Dr. Warren and other leading radicals as of that spring were trying to calm the crowd and trying to keep people from becoming violent. That was partly because they wanted to maintain peace and a respectable movement, partly because they probably worried that too much violence would provoke a military response from General Gage and the troops that people were not prepared to absorb. But really, at this point, early September 1774, there was no authority besides tradition that was guiding and organizing the protests. Now, interestingly, this being New England, it was a quite regimented society. It was a society with lots of traditions, among them that town meeting tradition, among them the militia tradition. And so that provided a great deal of cohesiveness and organization. When the men showed up to close the courts in the western part of the colony, they were not simply a mob. In fact, they often showed up in their militia companies and stood in ranks and answered to their militia officers, which both showed that they were organized, but also showed that they had military training and background, which sort of increased the threat that they presented. Yeah. Would you tell us about the New England militia tradition? How did the New England militia system work by 1774? 
This tradition, which was based on how England organized itself, but was even stronger in America because it was so far away from London that a community needed to be able to defend itself. So your neighbors in the community would organize into companies. The different towns would have one to three companies, depending on how large they were, and the towns would form regiments on a county level. By law, every white man between age 16 and 60 was supposed to be organizing and drilling with their militia unit four times a year. There were a lot of exceptions for, oh, ministers and Harvard graduates and people who had already been militia officers and could be retired or people who were debilitated. But still, this was something which basically every man in New England society, it was part of his experience in life, part of his responsibility as a member of society. As a result, that meant that really all the adult males had some military training, and more importantly, they knew how they could organize. They knew who were their lieutenants and captains because they had elected those men. They knew who they would march with. They knew what the signals were. So it provided a very strong self-defense force. And as it happened over the summer of 1774, it came into people's heads. The idea took hold that what they really needed to defend themselves against now was not the natives or the French or the Spanish, but the royal government itself. You noted that the militia system was created because there was this belief that a community needed to be able to defend itself. Is this belief why Boston had an artillery company? Yes. Boston, being the largest town in Massachusetts, had the largest militia regiment. It had a regiment all to itself. And as part of that, they started to go beyond the regular infantry. So they had an artillery company, which trained with four small cannon. In the 1770s, they developed a grenadier company, supposed to be larger elite soldiers. There was another impetus behind creating these specialized companies, which was that they provided more openings for officers. And becoming a militia officer was a way to rise up in society. It's a way to prove yourself to your neighbors and to become a respected person and eventually a gentleman in society. So we see a lot of striving, ambitious young men forming militia companies or lobbying to become militia officers to be chosen by their neighbors for that respectable post. Now, when you say regiment, how many men are we talking about exactly? That's a good question. How many men? And it's not easy to answer because the records are not very complete. Since everybody was expected to come out for militia drills, the officers were supposed to be counting noses and taking attendance, but very few of those records survive. The Boston Public Library has, I think, the records of one company only. Usually a regiment was between 600 and 900 men, but it could be variable. We don't really have official figures of how many men turned out until the beginning of the war when, under the militia laws, they were expecting to be paid. This wasn't just an obligation to drill. This was actual service. And for that, they provided lists to the Massachusetts government, which kept those lists. And so now we know exactly who turned out in April 1775. But we don't know who was turning out at the court closings and at the powder alarm and at other events in the summer of 1774. Are there better records for the Boston Artillery Company? I mean, do we know how many men would have served in that company? I have not been able to find those records, and I've been looking for them for 15 years. There was a list I found in an early biography of Henry Knox, and I was really excited about that because I could you know, cross-correlate those names. And as I was doing that work, I realized that this was actually not a list based on any sort of contemporaneous document taken down by the officers of that company. It was this historian looking back and saying, okay, here are the people who were involved in artillery during the war who also had a tie to Boston, so they must have been in this regiment or this company. And I realized that it wasn't reliable. So by golly, I wish that document did exist. I have not been able to find it. But it seems like we do have at least some records and information about the artillery company because We happen to know that it had four cannon. And in that regard, would you tell us the story about Boston's four field pieces? In the 1760s, when this artillery company, which was called the Train, was founded, it started with two small brass cannon. Now, brass or bronze cannon were the most advanced available. Pound for pound, they were stronger than iron cannon, more reliable. If they burst, they didn't burst quite so catastrophically. 
So this was a good thing to have. And in fact, it looks like they were practically the only brass cannon that were in the Massachusetts militia. In 1768, this company got two more from London. They were very proud of these. We can see in the newspaper records that these men would parade on holidays like the King's birthday and on militia training days, they would have war games on Boston Common with half of the company taking two of the cannon and pretending to be the British and half taking two of the cannon and pretending to be the hated French and chasing each other around the common while the rest of Boston watched. So these men and their cannon were a great source of pride for the community of Boston. In the mid-1760s, a unit of the Royal Artillery, the regular army, had been stuck in Boston by the weather over a winter. So they had spent their time training many of the men in the Boston train who then passed on that training. So they really were a very highly trained artillery unit. They knew how to shoot these cannon well, how to maneuver. There were some other elements of artillery that I'm not so sure they were as good at as they thought, getting the right ordnance, the right balls and powder and so on, using mortars seems to have been a problem for them. But with these four little cannon, they were very proud. We've talked about how in 1774 and 1775, the colonists out in the countryside were seizing gunpowder and presumably arms too from these powder houses. With all of this going on, did Thomas Gage ever fear that the colonists might attempt to seize Boston's four cannon too? And if so, what sort of precautions did he take to keep the cannon in his control? Almost immediately after the powder alarm, we can see towns out in the countryside starting to look at their own local powder houses to see what military supplies they have. Within a couple of weeks, the cannon that were in the battery alongside the shore, alongside the Charles River at Charlestown, Massachusetts, well, the cannon there disappeared one night. And then the great gun disappeared from Dorchester on the other side of Boston Harbor. And then one night there was a confrontation over the guns in Boston's North Battery in the North End and on Governor's Island. So yes, indeed, it was quite clear that the colonists, now that they were all riled up, were trying to grab as many cannon as they could. And the British military was responding by trying to seize these weapons or put guards over them. The four brass cannon that belonged to the Boston train were in two small gun houses, which I imagine are about the size of a one-car garage in the middle of town. And General Gage put guards outside them to make sure that they did not disappear. The man in charge of the company at this time, a man named Major Adno Paddock, was a loyalist, and so he was on the governor's side. Most of the men in the company, however, were Whigs or patriots, and they simply dissolved and refused to meet any longer to take any orders from Adno Paddock. So clearly, this was going to be a fault point. So General Gage, as I say, put guards in front of their gun houses, as they were called, these little armories. And then one morning after a dark and stormy night, I've looked up the weather report, it was raining that night, people found that there was a hole in the back of the older gun house and the two cannon that were inside were missing. So General Gage immediately put a stronger guard on the other gun house. Two days later, he had an officer of the Royal Artillery go to Major Paddock, ask for the key to that gun house. They went, they opened it, and the cannon that were inside that one were also gone. So this leaves us with two questions, John. Is there anything in the historical record that tells us what happened to these cannon? And what does one do with cannon in Boston, which at the time was occupied by all these British soldiers who are presumably looking for these cannon? Exactly. In fact, the second gun house, the one that was burgled later with a double guard outside, that was right across the street from Boston Common where British redcoats were camped that day. So uh, how could you get into the gun house itself since it was locked, since it was guarded, since it had troops nearby, since it was behind a fence? That was a big mystery. Nobody could figure it out. 49 years later, a man who said he was involved in this theft, his explanation was published in a biography of James Otis, the Boston Patriot. And by using that, I was able to work back in the sources to figure out what probably happened, how the Patriots got those cannon out. And it involved sneaking in through a nearby school And furthermore, hiding the cannon after they got them out of the armory itself inside that school. And then the whole plot 
depended on nobody in that school giving up the secret. And there were probably 200 plus boys going to that school six days of the week and also a fair number of girls going there during the break for private lessons. There was a teacher, there was a, an assistant teacher, and nobody told the authorities what was inside the wood box where the firewood was usually kept. It was not just firewood in the fall of 1774. At the bottom of that box, there were also two brass cannons. That's pretty amazing, the fact that nobody said anything. I mean, it gives you a sense of the idea, I mean, if this is what really happened, of the unity in Boston against the government. Exactly. Yes, this is a very cohesive society. This particular school is called a writing school rather than a Latin school. So it wasn't the top rank of societies, the boys who were represented there. It was the next group down, the sons of lower merchants and mechanics, the strivers. And those were the people, I think, who were the true backbone of the revolutionary resistance because they had the most to gain from keeping their own society free from new British laws while also keeping their mobility within that society. So, John, the rebels have the cannon and they're presumably hidden somewhere in Boston, which begs a question. What did the rebels do with the cannon once they had them? I mean, how do the rebels intend to use the cannon and do they intend to use them in the city? Well, quite quickly, they began to try to get cannon out. And some of the first that were moved out of Boston were cannon that had been in private hands in belonging to hardware merchants, it looks like. And there are stories of them being smuggled out in wagons of manure. There's a story of a boat loaded with cannon running aground in the mill pond, which was on the western side of the town, and the Royal Navy grabbing the guns in that boat which had been deserted. In the case of the four cannon, the brass cannon that belonged to the Boston train, it's not exactly clear how they got out. Years later, traditions, one of which says two of them were rowed out and two of them were taken out in a wagon under manure. We do know that it looks like William Dawes was involved in getting at least two of those cannon out. And William Dawes is a name that fans of the Revolutionary War will probably recognize because he was the other rider with Paul Revere in April 1775, the other man who carried the news from Boston to Lexington that Redcoats were on their way. So he had been part of the revolutionary movement all along. And when the Massachusetts Provincial Congress wanted those cannon under its control, they asked Dawes to facilitate that. So however they did it, the rebels seized the cannon and somehow found a way to smuggle them out of Boston. And I wonder, is this why Gage ordered his men to march on Concord on April 19, 1775? Eventually, we know that General Gage in 1775, he began to look for these cannon in a very serious way. Whenever he had intelligence of brass cannon anywhere in Massachusetts, he sent troops there. So he sent troops to Salem in February 1775 after hearing that there might be brass cannon being worked on there. Then he had a spy out in Middlesex County, a person whose identity I still have not been able to establish, sending him word that there was now cannon in Concord. He sent two British officers in disguise out to confirm that information. He had confirming information also from Dr. Benjamin Church, who was one of the patriot leaders at that point and had become a spy. So General Gage had very good information that the four cannon from Boston were out in Concord in April 1775. And on his first draft of instructions for the march out to Concord, at the very top of the list of what the men should look for are the four brass cannon. So here we are. The road to Concord has led us to the battles of Lexington and Concord. John, Would you provide us with an overview of these battles and tell us whether or not these four cannon that the rebels somehow spirited out of Boston played any role in the battles? My book comes right up to the moment when the soldiers have come into Concord, and then it doesn't tell the rest of the story because it's been told very well by other books. But as I say, the British went out to find these cannon. Now, just before they marched, it appears that General Gage had word that 
Colonel James Barrett, the militia colonel out in Concord who had been placed in charge of storing all these weapons and getting them ready for use, he was moving things out of his own property and his neighbor's property further out into the countryside. And there are stories from Colonel Barrett's grandsons of how they were loading these cannon and other goods into ox carts and rumbling them through the roads out to places like Stowe and Groton. So already, as soon as he had sent the troops out, Gage already knew that it might be too late, but he nevertheless wanted to go through with this mission. The soldiers were supposed to march as swiftly as possible to Concord after crossing the Charles River, then going straight west through Cambridge, through the village of Monotomy, through Lexington, where they ran into a militia company on the Lexington Common. Now, that militia company had been roused by news from Boston, news brought by Paul Revere and William Dawes, that the troops were on their way. And there was a great fear among the Massachusetts patriots that the goal of General Gage and whatever military maneuvers he was going to do was to arrest leaders like John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who were in Lexington at the time. So it looks like Lexington was on a particularly high alert because of those leaders. In fact, the orders from General Gage don't say anything about John Hancock and Samuel Adams. He wasn't tracking them. He missed a lot of opportunities to arrest organizers if he really wanted to. He was after the cannon. So from his point of view, from the point of view of the orders of the British officers, they were simply supposed to go straight through Lexington. But there seems to have been some fear that they would stop there to arrest Hancock and Adams. As the soldiers marched through Lexington, seeing this militia company on the town common, which was right next to the road that the soldiers needed to take to go on to Concord, well, they could not simply expose their flank to these armed men. So the soldiers lined up against the militiamen. The British officers ordered the militiamen to put down their weapons and disperse. The Lexington men began to disperse, but not putting down their weapons, taking their weapons away. A shot rang out. Nobody's sure where it came from. And that prompted the British soldiers to fire into the militia company and kill several men. The commander of the march arrived in Lexington shortly after that, got the men back organized because all he cared about was moving as quickly as possible to Concord, and this was just an interruption for him. So he got the men going west. They reached Concord in the middle of the morning of April 19th. And the Concord militia had also been roused because they knew very well that they had all these armaments, all these cannons, this gunpowder, food, other military implements in their town. But they were not yet prepared to battle the British army. So that militia simply turned around and walked west out of town and gathered up on a hill and watched as the British took the town, started to search all these places that General Gage had heard about from his spies where they were supposed to be able to find gunpowder and cannon and other weapons. The soldiers actually went across the North Bridge out to the farm where Colonel James Barrett and his family had been hiding these weapons. And they searched that farm thoroughly. They found some what were called carriage wheels, the wheels that you needed to mount cannon on to move them around during battle. And they started to burn those. Meanwhile, back in town, there was another set of gun carriages found guns, cannon, large iron cannon, which probably belonged to Concord itself. So they didn't move those out. (laughs) They were not ready to give up their property. And as a result, the British soldiers found those guns. And the soldiers also began to burn those carriages in Concord. The fire from those carriages started to lick against the meeting house or a house, and it started to catch on fire. The smoke from that fire, which was actually pretty quickly put out by the townspeople and the soldiers working together, the smoke from that fire was enough to arouse the militiamen of the town who were massing on this hill outside and had been joined by companies from other nearby towns. And that galvanized those militiamen. So they decided that they would march down onto the North Bridge, which was guarded by three British soldiers, and make a show of force. This produced another confrontation, more shots, deaths on both sides this time. And then, curiously, the Concord men pulled back, and they didn't hold that position, which allowed the soldiers out at Colonel Barrett's farm to march back across the bridge unimpeded and rejoin the main body of the Redcoats in Concord. 
So this was the second or third time that the conquered militia and its compatriots had actually stepped back from a confrontation. They really weren't trying to fight until they had larger numbers, which were gradually increasing by the hour, and until the redcoats were out of the center of town so they would not have hostages or property or other damage. As the British soldiers left Concord, heading back east, having destroyed a couple of cannon, having burned some gun carriages, having carried out their orders, they were withdrawing as ordered back towards Boston. And at that point, the Concord militiamen and the militia companies of neighboring towns just opened up on them and started to shoot as the soldiers were moving along the road. And that was really the beginning of the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And the British redcoats had to fight their way all the way back to Charlestown through Concord, through Lincoln, through Lexington, where they met up with a reinforcement column, then through the village of Monotomy, which had very bloody fighting as more and more militiamen arrived, Cambridge, and then finally Charlestown as night fell. It was supposed to be a quick and successful raid on this. Basically, it was a search for weapons of mass destruction. It was a search for the most advanced weapons that an army had at the time, the cannon. That was what General Gage wanted. And instead, what he had was the destruction of a few weapons, but the beginning of this war, so that by the end of the day, there were 20,000 militiamen ringing Boston, and he truly had no authority any longer because he was now facing an armed resistance. So it sounds like the regulars found Concord's cannon, but they didn't find the four cannon from Boston. Do we know what became of these field pieces? I mean, did they ever see action during the War for Independence? Well, it's an irony that they were seen as so important. There are moments in early April 1775 where the Patriots are very proud of themselves for having gotten so many cannon, being ready for war. And then as soon as the war starts, well, those guns are never put into the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And suddenly people realize, you know, these are pretty small guns. These are two pounders and three pounders, which by standards at that time, that meant they shot cannonball that weighed two pounds or three pounds. That was actually very small by army standards. Usually you wanted a six pounder, a nine pounder, an 18 pounder. And so as soon as the war began, those cannon became much less important. There were just scattered references to them over the next year during the Siege of Boston. They were probably deployed into Dorchester or Roxbury, pointing up the neck at Boston to make sure the British did not come out of the city that way. But they were then sort of lost in the records because the Continental Army did not keep careful records of what guns were assigned where. We only know about them because at the end of the war, the new governor of Massachusetts, John Hancock, wrote to the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, and asked for the cannon to be returned because they had been Boston or Massachusetts property belonging to the Massachusetts militia. And you know, now that the war is over, the Continental Army doesn't need them anymore. So Henry Knox had them returned, but he had them returned with engravings on them. There were only two left at that point, probably the two that were stolen second. And he had them engraved saying that these were half of the entire field artillery of the American forces at the beginning of the war, which was a great exaggeration because records show that there were dozens of cannon under the control of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, not to mention what the other colonies had at the beginning of the war. But it made a better story to say that there were only four cannon that the entire American army had at the start. Because these two surviving cannon were engraved with their story, that meant that it is possible to track them exactly for the next more than 200 years now because they were unique. Furthermore, Henry Knox had one dubbed the Adams and the other dubbed the Hancock. So they even have their names. They're like old veterans telling their story with a little exaggeration. And they became eventually prized relics of the revolution in Massachusetts. The road to Concord is what we historians call a microhistory, in that it explores this larger period of time, the revolution in Boston, Massachusetts, and how the colonists and imperial forces came to meet at the battles of Lexington and Concord, all through the story of Boston's four cannon. John, why do you think the story of these four cannon is important for us to know about? I mean, how does this small story change what we know about the revolution and the battles of Lexington and Concord? Well, the most important lesson or change in how we see those events that this book talks about, I believe, is that it really documents that the Middlesex farmers were not innocent, peace-loving people who were brutally attacked by the British army in April 1775. 
in fact, they were well equipped and they were preparing for war. They were also being very careful not to take the first steps toward war if they could help it. But it was a culmination of months of preparation by the Massachusetts Patriots and their government out in the countryside, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, to create an army that was able to take on the British Army, the official Royal British Army. So that is one element. Another is looking back, it is important to, I think, to understand that the efforts to create this artillery and to start building a resistance force actually even predated the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, which started to meet in October 1774. Well, these cannon and other cannon were being stolen and collected in September 1774. So this was really a bottom-up effort, and it was the people, the communities working together to preserve what they felt was their own self-defense that led to the creation of this army, and not there was a class of politicians or military leaders up on top telling everyone, this is what we must do now. These were spontaneous acts by communities to preserve their own weaponry. And then a third lesson that I can't help but think about when I look at this story is the lesson for General Thomas Gage. He was the British commander. He was the royal governor of Massachusetts. And although I cannot find statements from him about his motivation, I feel that it must have been troubling to him to have lost those four cannon out of gun houses under guard in a town that he had army everywhere. How could they get away? Wasn't that an embarrassment to him? And wasn't that what caused him to be so diligent in trying to get them back and sending troops wherever he heard about brass cannon in 1775? It's significant that there is no surviving report from General Gage to London mentioning these brass cannon. So I think that he was trying to cover up the fact that they had gone missing on his watch until he could get them back which means that he might have had a very personal, career-oriented reason to order the march out to Concord as opposed to other measures against the Patriot opposition. And so one other lesson of this story, I would argue, is that sometimes a very personal individual motivation can have great consequences in a geopolitical scale even, which nobody could have anticipated at the start. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, What might have happened if General Thomas Gage and his men had secured Boston's four cannon? Would anything about the course of the battles of Lexington and Concord or the larger war for independence have been different if they had? I think it depends on when that securing might have taken place. For instance, if the guards on the gun houses in September 1774 had been more successful at keeping those cannon out of the Patriots' hands, that would have spared General Gage some embarrassment, possibly. I don't think because of the size of those cannon and the fact that the general was grabbing most of the other cannon inside Boston, I don't think it would have really made a strategic difference in the armaments. Most of the cannon that the Massachusetts Provincial Congress collected were from outside Boston and were old iron guns from ships and batteries. And so they would still have been able to do that. But for General Gage's motivation, things might have been different. When he received orders from London that he should quell this rebellion, the advice from London was that he should arrest the leaders. And yet he never took that step. Instead, he focused on the cannon. Well, if those missing cannon had not existed, then maybe he would have focused on arresting leaders like Dr. Joseph Warren, who was still in Boston and well within reach in April 1775. He might have collected more intelligence on where leaders like Samuel Adams and John Hancock were, and in fact tried to arrest them. For instance, if he had still ordered an expedition out to the countryside in April 1775, but instead of going all the way out to Concord to look for armaments, they only went out to Lexington to try to capture Hancock and Adams, well, that would have been a quicker march out and a quicker march back, and the British forces might not have suffered so much from the fighting. So there are ways it would have been different. 
Ultimately, however, I think that there would have been a conflict anyway, that the differences between the Crown and the Massachusetts Patriots were just irreconcilable by the spring of 1775. For the Patriots, they were able to spin the way the march on April 19th took place and the way the fighting took place into a story of British aggression and tyranny. And if things had happened which caused the patriots to appear to be the aggressors, that might have changed how popular opinion in other colonies and in Britain itself reacted to the outbreak of war. So that's another way that with a few more variables, things could have been quite different. John, you've written a book. You write daily blog posts about early American history on Boston1775.net. So I'm really not sure if you have any time left, but if you do, what are you researching and writing about now? Well, I am thinking about skipping over the actual battle left in Concord and picking up the story of the Massachusetts artillery the next day, or maybe two days later, as the Massachusetts Provincial Congress tried to get themselves organized to fight the siege of Boston. And they started out, they went to a very respected old artillerist, a man in his 60s who had fought at the fall of Lewisburg 30 years before. And they asked him to be the head of the Massachusetts Artillery Regiment. And he agreed as long as his youngest son could be his second in command or a high officer. And over the next several months, it became clear that neither of them were up to their jobs. And as General Washington took over, he finally had to, by October, find a way to ease the Colonel Richard Gridley out of his job to get rid of the son and to install a new artillery commander of his own choosing, who was Henry Knox. And the story of the politics and the military strategy involved in that maneuver, and then, of course, Knox's expedition out to Lake Champlain to bring back more weapons, that's something I'm thinking might be the logical follow-up to The Road to Concord. And where can we look for more information about you and how we can contact you, either with questions or, you know, the identity of that Concord spy you've been looking for? Okay, well, yes, you can drop tips at my website, which is boston1775.net. There's an email address there, or it's also boston1775 at earthlink.net. And I am happy to hear any news. As you say, it, Boston1775 is a blog, so every day I put out a little short article on some story I've found from the revolution or some event coming up or a way that the revolutionary politics relates to today's. And I've been doing that for over 10 years, so I hope to keep doing that. And I hope to see folks there. John Bell, thank you so much for taking us down the road to Concord. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Wes. It's great to talk to you again. Parliament passed the Massachusetts Government Act to rein in Boston and to turn the people of Massachusetts against the city. Their plan failed. Instead of bringing Boston back under imperial control, the Massachusetts Government Act spurred the people of Massachusetts to rise up in arms to defend Boston and the rights of all Bay colonists. And it was this strong reaction of the Bay colonists against the Massachusetts Government Act that quickly made it apparent to General Thomas Gage and to rebel leaders that the people living in the Massachusetts countryside, who they once thought of as quiet and benign, were actually more militant than the people living in Boston. Now, as John revealed, the history of the Boston Artillery Company's four cannon offers us a great window through which to view how the people of Massachusetts came to face the British regulars on the battlefields of Lexington and Concord. Because the story of Boston's four cannon demonstrates how relations with Great Britain broke down and what caused the colonists to arm for war. Now, one aspect of this story that we didn't cover in this episode is how the people of Lexington and Concord knew the Redcoats were marching and that they should turn out in arms to greet them. And that's because our next episode will take us through Paul Revere's ride through history. It's a fun story, and it's our next Doing History to the Revolution series preview. Look for more information about John, his book, The Road to Concord, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash one two nine. The Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture supports and promotes the work of scholars investigating the early American past. The OA makes it possible for historians to do history and for people like us to get access to that history. And one of the many ways that the OI does this work is by supporting this podcast. For more information about the Omohundro Institute and its work, 
visit benfranklinsworld.com slash doing history. Finally, do you think the fact that Thomas Gage didn't write to London meant that he was trying to cover up how he lost the cannon and the reasons for the battles of Lexington and Concord? Send your answers to Liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.